I'm an associate professor in the Department of Laboratory Medicine. I'm a, I'm a physician scientist, but I don't see patients. I'm a pathologist, so I may see some of your samples when they come to the clinical lab, but I do not see, get to see any of you. So I, I really enjoy this event because I actually get to, um, actually get to see, uh, see everyone in person, which is um, unusual for me. <laughs> and so, um, but I, I will say, essentially, I, I'm the director of the um, UCSF Stephen and Nancy Grand Multiple Myeloma Translational Initiative Laboratory. And so um, in that role, essentially, what we try to do is come up with new strategies to better diagnose and treat myeloma. And that's really our goal. And so every year I try to come here and give a bit of an update in terms of what have we done for the past year, what do we want to do for the next year in terms of fighting within my lab this disease that affects all of us. And as we've already heard from Guy, you know, August is working on trying to seed research projects into other labs at UCSF to take advantage of this amazing research infrastructure that we have here, literally one of the leading research universities in the entire world. We want to get more people working on myeloma. How do we integrate basic science that are, is coming out of our research labs into clinical effects and benefits for patients. And so that's, my lab kind of stands as the bridge between those two efforts. And so that's really what I'm here to talk to you about. And you know, really before I start too, I just want to thank all of you, um, many of you in the room already who made critical contributions to our efforts, both not only financially, but also as Tom mentioned, with your samples, really. I mean, having studies that really identifying what's going on in patients, and this is critical to Guy's research now, taking samples from the clinic back to the laboratory, that's where we make the biggest strides in translational research in many cases. So I just want to thank all of you for contributing to the research programs in that fashion because um, that, that allows us to make new advances. And so, um, so over the past two years in my lab, immunotherapy really has become a major focus of what we're working on. And there's kind of two major themes that I want to talk to you about. Like one first is, understanding mechanisms of resistance in a different way than guys working on, but very complementary to existing immunotherapies. And another that Jeff alluded to, um, essentially discovering using technologies that we have developed in my lab, trying to find new targets for myeloma that maybe can overcome some of the limitations we have with existing ones, and basically trying to make everybody get better. So that's our goal. And so in terms of understanding mechanisms of resistance, you've already heard a little bit about immunotherapies in general. What I like to think about is kind of we're putting the immune system on a search and destroy mission for tumor cells. But really that recognition, that recognition of cancer depends on this one specific protein on the surface of tumor cells that ideally is only on the myeloma cell or other malignant plasma cell and not on other cells. That's what we want to find. And so we can design either antibodies, which again, these are natural molecules our body uses to fight infections. We can engineer these in the lab to recognize that protein on the tumor cell. Or we, can design, um, or we can design CAR T's, as you heard about, which essentially uses a part of an antibody that that's kind of that specific recognition handle that allows for that searching and then targets the T cell to destroy. And so we can use those two approaches. But the issue is both of those rely on having that specific marker. And the problem is tumor cells are wily. And sometimes they can just get rid of that target and then they're immune, basically. They aren't gonna see the therapy. And so we're really curious in terms of figuring out how can we force the tumor cells to express that target? How can we make them be susceptible to our immunotherapies? Because we know from clinical data, both specific, I'll talk to you about daratumumab or Darzelix, which many of you may know, and as well as the therapies targeting BCMA, both CAR T's and bites we'll hear about. Clinically, we know that typically if tumors express higher levels of those proteins, they're more susceptible to the therapies. And so what we want to say is, well, we want to make every tumor express a ton of those proteins so we can kill them all. That's the goal. And so one of the things that we've recently been working on, um, a paper we just published a couple weeks ago, and, um, and uh, I'll tell you a little bit, bit about, um, related to daratumumab resistance. So we had a specific scientific hypothesis, an idea we had in the lab, that we thought if we treated myeloma plasma cells with this drug that's already FDA approved, used in patients with different blood cancers called AML, MDS, um, we thought that this could increase levels of CD38, which is that's the specific protein that's the target of daratumumab. And so we went in the lab, we demonstrated this, we showed it worked, um, very excited about it, um, but not, we're not just excited just because we showed this in the lab and got a nice paper out of it, but really what we're excited about is we're going to Nina and her fellow Sweta to bring this to a clinical trial, because we think this can be a way to overcome daratumumab resistance, basically with this small molecule that can control the levels of the protein. And so that's really what we want to do in the lab is take these ideas that we develop in the lab 
and bring them to patients. And so this is, you know, hopefully we've done this in the past with other molecules developed at companies. This is something totally coming out of our group, and we want to see more and more of that. So that's one of our major goals going in the future is bring our discoveries to benefit our UCSF patients, and then ideally many more people around the world. Um, so, uh, so I do want to say too, along those themes, um, you know, so that, that project we have now, though, that developed one very specific hypothesis. So we had the idea, if we give this molecule that already exists in the clinic to myeloma patients, it could make daratumumab work better. But what if we took a much broader approach? What if we said, let's look at these two immunotherapy targets in myeloma, both CD38 and BCMA, in separate experiments. Let's try and control every gene in the cancer genome and see what affects the levels of expression at the surface of the tumor cells. And so to do this, we took advantage of, again, the amazing research community here, um, Martin Campman, who's attended this dinner before. Um, unfortunately, couldn't make it tonight, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the work we've been doing together. Um, he's an expert in this technology called CRISPR interference. And many of you may have heard of CRISPR before. If, if not, basically, it's a totally new technology that we can use to basically edit and cut the genome, kind of copy-paste for DNA, They're totally revolutionary. And so what Martin worked on was coming up with a way that we can use this technology to specifically turn on or off every single gene in the genome, all 20,000 genes individually in different cells. And so we took this approach collaboratively, his lab working on BCMA, mine on CD38. We use this technology to basically, again, turn off every gene in the genome individually, see what changes the protein levels of the cell surface. And so his lab has actually come up with some really exciting ways using small molecules to affect the levels of BCMA in the cell surface. And so again, the goal here is to be, we could treat patients with this small molecule, treat them with a CAR-T, treat them with a bite targeting BCMA, and it's gonna work better. Or maybe you can overcome resistance due to loss of that antigen. And they already showed in their paper that they're just uh, writing up now that um, indeed this can work for other antibody-based mechanisms um, uh, for targeting BCMA. It can make them work better. And so now the next step is, can we get those into patients? Those, I will caution, are a little farther off. The small molecules they're using are um, not FDA approved yet, so it's a higher bar to try and bring those to patients. But even so, we hope that those are the kind of things that we can do in the future. Um, so then the other approach, so kind of the second part of the, the talk and the theme is discovering new targets. And so my expertise actually, I, so again, I'm not, I'm not a hematologist, oncologist. I actually did my PhD in single molecule biophysics, basically applying mechanical forces to single proteins. Okay, this is about as, looking at chemical reactions to single proteins. It's about as far away from immunotherapy, from a patient as you can get, basically. But what I, what I did when I came here to UCSF, again, taking advantage of resources, I wanted to go from studying one, the pro, one protein at a time to all the proteins at once. And so I, I was trained in this technique called mass spectrometry-based proteomics. It's a bunch of big words. But essentially what this lets us do is monitor what's happening to thousands of different proteins at once in the cell. Because basically there's no other technology that can do this. And what's cool is there's um, different applications of this that allow us to specifically focus on what's going on at the cell surface. So essentially kind of that face of the cell where we want to target with immunotherapy. So we call it cell surface proteomics or also examining the cell surfaceome. It's another way to think about it. And so what we've done now is we're trying to build a pipeline and we're becoming successful at it, I think, within the lab of using this approach to both discover new immunotherapy targets and then make entirely new immunotherapies based on that data. And so right now we've had the most success actually, not in myeloma, but related B cell malignancies, lymphomas, leukemias. Recently we've discovered using this approach an entirely new target that no one else is going after. And not only do we find the new target, we said we want to make a new therapy that hopefully could get into patients. So Nina alluded to this a little bit, but basically um, the way the CAR-T works, and I mentioned that kind of like search and destroy mode, that specific recognition handle, that, that antibody fragment. Most people use this one type of antibody fragment that has a lot of limitations. If you want to kind of re-engineer it, put in different orientations, it's really confusing. So we thought there's a cool technology, and again, taking advantage of our amazing collaborators at UCSF, there's a group here that uses something called nanobodies. And they were using it to look at the structure of proteins using X-ray crystallography, totally different approaches. Um, and basically, they used it to make a protein go in one specific shape so they could look what it, see what it looks like. But we said, could we take that same approach and make CAR-Ts using it? And so what they had done was they developed a fully, uh, what we call in vitro, a system we could do in the lab. We could make these tiny antibody fragments, these nanobodies, 
against any protein of interest. And the important thing to know is nanobodies are proven. Like there's a company from China, many may have heard, Nanjing Legend. Now they've been in partnership with Janssen. They have a CAR-T targeting BCMA that uses nanobodies. But the problem with nanobodies is that you need to have a llama farm. Basically, you need to immunize a llama with your protein, see what antibody it raises, and turn into your CAR T. I mean, I love llamas. Like, they're super cute. You know, I mean, they're fuzzy, they're great, they come to my kids' petting zoos. But, you know, I, I don't have space to, I mean, they could graze out here, but I don't really have space for a llama farm. So I think what was really exciting is we showed that we could take this platform fully in the lab, develop new nanobody binders versus this target, and now make very active CAR Ts that work just as well as the ones for these B cell cancers that are already in the clinic. And so, um, and so, and our goal is to try and get these to patients. So we're, we're now, um, you know, we're now uh, moving forward with our preclinical development. And so now we're trying to do the same thing in myeloma. So, so basically what we're looking at now specifically, we're looking at models of disease that's resistant to current therapy. So say like bortezomib, um, so vel velcade, revlimid. We're looking at models that are resistant to those drugs and saying, do they have new markers of their cell surface that are increased. So could they be more susceptible to new immunotherapies? So that's one major effort we have in the lab, looking at different genomic subtypes of myeloma. So we know there's kind of many different types of myeloma, many of you may have heard. We're trying to look, do different ones of those have specific markers we can target? Um, and then specifically, a new project in my lab, we're trying to say, in myeloma, they might have the same proteins that you find in other normal cells, which could maybe, if you targeted that, that could lead to a lot of side effects. But those proteins actually might have different shapes, different what we call conformations, very specific to the tumor cell. So we're trying to come up with new technologies to discover these different protein shapes that are only in the cancer cell, and then we can use our approach to make new CAR-Ts against them. And so this is something that we you know, are very excited about. Um, you know, I, I just want to say, kind of in conclusion, um, you know, really, uh, I really feel like we're making a lot of exciting progress in the lab. Um, we're really trying to take advantage, again, of the incredible depth and breadth of research here across UCSF to advance our work for myeloma patients. Um, and, uh, and, you know, it, it just, it's exciting to come to work every day and be in the lab and lead my team and know that we're doing science that could lead to new discoveries that could hopefully benefit those in, your, in this room and also in the wider world. So thank you so much for your time. Thanks. I, I, I hope you guys realize um, just how wonderful Arun and his laboratory are. When you think about all the different things that are going on in your lab, you know, and you're as young as my children. I, 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 <laughs> um, and I, I think adding Arun to, to our program and making him the hub of all the science that we're doing has been such a phenomenal addition to our program, and I want to thank, thank you very much. You. You've been incredible. And this is what, um, when, when Cammie and Tom and I got together and first wrote our proposal for Steve and Nancy Grand to fund our research here, this is what we were thinking about. And Steve regularly thanks me for finding a room. <laughs> Actually, Cammie found a room. <laughs> but anyway, thank you, Arun. Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah. Thanks. Should I take any questions? Please. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. There, Anyone have any questions? Are there any questions for Arun? Yeah. Uh, over here, Mr. Osborne. Yeah. I can speak about that thing. One thing I've always been curious about with respect to myeloma is that it does not appear to be an off the rack cancer, that there are so many forms of it. So, how are you addressing every different slide to come up with a commonality with respect to your research? Mm -hmm. Right, it's a really great question. I mean, it's one of these things that we're trying to figure out now, I, I would say, because basically we're trying to figure out what are the changes in, the, in those different forms of disease, or again, after resistance to other therapies, like what has changed broadly? We can study it first in kind of cell line models in the lab, but then we have to do this validation. And, th and that, honestly, that's where all of your research participation comes in, in terms of having bone marrow samples that we can do this validation on. So it's hard to know up front. We can use our other databases we can use of so-called RNA expression, basically, to try and see are some of these RNA levels different between different patient types. That can be one clue. The issue is like, for those of you kind of going back to, um, you know, high, high school biology, I guess, I mean, thinking about RNA is so translated into protein. So basically it's kind of the message, but the protein is really the building block. 
it doesn't, it's not always predictive. Just because you have more RNA doesn't mean you have more protein. And so we really need to test that and validate it. So it's an excellent question. It's something we're trying to tackle right now, but it, take, it takes a lot of work to show that this is applicable for everybody. And so, um, but, and, and even it, but even in the end, I would, I would say that, you know, if we have some therapies that end up working very well for some subtypes of myeloma, that's still a win. You know, I mean, it's still, it'd be great if it worked for everybody, but if, if we identify a subset of myeloma that we can cure with our therapies, that's still a win, and we can build on that to get it to everybody else. But, but, but you're so right about that, because everybody in the room with myeloma has a slightly different flavor, if you will. I mean, we have people who have lots of bone disease. We have other people who had renal failure, kidney failure. We have other patients who have it just in their marrow and not in their bones or in their kidneys. And, 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 then that's, and then we know when we look at mutations, everybody has slightly different mutations th that maybe led to the myeloma or make them slightly different. Everybody responds differently to drugs. You, you guys realize it's not as simple as antibiotics where we can take a bacteria that may be causing you a urinary tract infection, put it in a Petri dish and throw some antibiotics at it and figure out which one works doesn't work that way. So we, what we have to do is you become the Petri dish. You with myeloma are the Petri dish where we give you all what we think is the best combination, RVD. It may not work for you, but it may work for you. And then we have to switch therapies. So the day may come, the, I hope the day comes, when we can predict ahead of time which drugs are going to work, who has what flavor. Right. You've got chocolate and you've got vanilla and different drugs work. We do know, for example, now that I think about it, the translation, uh, a translocation um, of an 11 and 14, a piece of the 11th chromosome, a piece of the 14th, can make a patient susceptible to a new drug called venetoclax. So we're getting to a point where we might be able to select our drugs, but we're, we're far from having it all figured out. Right. And, and I shall just add to that, I mean, along the same lines, we have a new project, I didn't talk about it here, but a new project in the lab related to, for patients with a translocation of chromosome 4 and 14, which is about 15% of myeloma patients. We, there's another new drug that was co-developed between UCSF and this biotech in Redwood City, and we think that they looked at lung cancer, but we think that this subset of myeloma patients is going to be super susceptible to that drug. So we're just starting a new, uh, again, all in the lab study, very far from patients, but we're just starting to validate that hypothesis and say, okay, we think this could be a very good small molecule therapy for that subset of patients. Any other questions for Arun? Yes, sir. Can the same patient get CAR T cell therapy more than once? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> that's, a, that's a tough one. Let, let Tom, let Tom so if it can just stay in this room, yeah. okay. <laughs> the answer is maybe. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so most of the CAR T trials say that in their eligibility that you have not received a prior CAR T cell therapy. We, um, in fact, work together with, in the myeloma community, everybody really across the country, the myeloma community has been great, and we know the people up in Seattle quite well, the myeloma program in Seattle, and, the, and they have a CAR T cell that's also targeted against BCMA, and we have a patient, one of my patients who had a, a CAR therapy at UCSF had no response at all. In fact, the proteins just continued to go up. And I, in fact, I was just sitting with the person um, at Seattle at a conference, and I, I said, Damien, you know what? My person just didn't, um, didn't respond at all whatsoever. I want him to come see you. And he said, all right, send him up. I'll see what we can do. So you know, she, in fact, got on his trial, and she took a, he, she took a drug. It was called a gamma secretase inhibitor. Gamma secretase is, a, is an enzyme that cuts BCMA off the surface of the cell. So it tries to actually take away the protein that it's the car cell, the T cell, the CAR T cell is targeting. So she took this pro, she took this drug to get rid of the gamma secretase inhibition, probably increased the amount of BCMA on her surface, got her cars in Seattle, and she's back down after spending um, two months there. Got pretty sick during the CAR T. It worked, and now she's in a pretty deep remission. So that's an end of one. Don't tell them I said that, okay? <laughs> you didn't hear it from me. Uh, so it can happen. So the, the, the answer is probably you can't give the same one again. Right. Or the same way. You know, you just, um, if it didn't work the first time or if 
if the cars became exhausted the first time, the new ones aren't going to work for some reason. But perhaps a slightly different approach, like getting rid of gamma secretase. Any other questions for Arun? Great, thanks okay. Arun. All right, thanks so much.